We started with um, having the HIV patient reps sitting at the table. They were not members of the committee in the beginning. They were, uh, they were, they used to come to the committee meetings. Uh, FDA has advisory committee meetings when you have questions about does this data really support a finding of safety and efficacy and how do you balance it? Does it need special labeling to protect people from adverse events if there are some that can be preventable? Um, those kind of questions come up and FDA will bring them to an advisory committee. And I think one of the great values of the advisory committee is it's the only place that all of this information gets shared with the public because FDA has to protect the confidentiality of all the applications. So there's always an open public hearing where the public can speak at the advisory committee and, F and, and the AIDS patients would come, AIDS activists would come, and they had a lot to say. But then they had their hour and then they had to sit down and listen to the conversation. But there were things in the conversation that they thought were being missed or that were misinformed. So they would stand up and they would blow whistles. And it was, you know, the very famous AIDS activism that we know from the 90s. And I think, you know, at some point people said, why don't we bring them to the table and let them participate in the conversation, which is what they wanted. And so at first they did. They didn't have access to the background materials, but they sat at the table. Um, and they had a lot to say, and it was very valuable. Then uh, we thought, why can't we do this with cancer patients? And in the beginning, there was, there was sort of a resistance to it, because people inside the review divisions, who had always done things the way they did them, thought, well, if you ask patients what they want, they're going to say you should approve this drug, and it would be that simple. I think the patients, when they get involved in the advisory committee meetings, and especially now, they get all the background material, they get all of the analysis, they get everything from the clinical trials. I think they, they put more effort into it than all the doctors and the statisticians do because they're going to be sitting there with those doctors and statisticians and they want to make sure that their position is credible with those people, that they have something to say that's meaningful, and they always do. And I think, you know, they, they study that stuff very carefully. They make notes in the margins. They ask really good questions. And I think that they do something that um, nobody else on the committee can do, which is they can challenge the committee and they can challenge the sponsor. Because I think there's a certain professional courtesy that prevents other people from doing that. And all of a sudden, you've got somebody who's the patient. And I think they're in a position to do it, and they do it. I think the other amazing thing about having a patient sitting at the table is that you have a patient sitting at the table so that nobody can talk about them as if they are a statistic because that statistic is sitting there looking at you as you're making your point on the committee. And I think that's had some sort of profound effect in the conversation on advisory committees because people are more cognizant of who they're talking about is the patient. You know, that's, that's who's going to use the product. That's who all of this is for. And there they are. So we can't talk of the, about them in the abstract. And I think that's been a really great advance in maybe medical science. <laughs>